So now I'd like to introduce um, our very special guest, Allison Oliva. Um, Allison is the principal at Comprehensive Clinical Consulting and really a, um, just a, you're, you're truly a subject matter expert in the Southern California area, Allison. Everybody knows you when we, when we talk about um, regulatory affairs and clinical trials and whatnot. So she's our very special guest today to moderate um, this esteemed panel as I am not an expert in this, <laughs> in this field. So I'm gonna hand it over to Allison. Good morning, everyone. My name is Allison Oliva. And I just want to leave this slide up so that we can talk about the real subject matter experts. Thank you, Julie and Karen for inviting me. If there are any technical glitches, that's because they're making me drive this morning. So that's entirely on me. <laughs> um, but really I'm going to serve as the moderator and we're going to hear specifically from Kasha, Mirta and Heike later on about what's going on in the regulatory clinical environment. So here I am, and here are some of the things that I assist clients with. I have worked in industry long enough that I've gone through several evolutions of regulatory changes. And I've worked for companies, I've worked for contract research organizations, and I have my own consulting business now. And I won't read the slide to you, but this is basically what I do. Today, we're talking specifically about clinical studies. And by that, I mean, when you have a concept and you have to put it into a human subject. So before we get on to what should you do in your clinical trials and how do you need to manage it in today's world, I wanted to do a little historical perspective. So, and because I've worked primarily in the medical device field with a little crossover, I'm going to concentrate on medical devices, whereas our real subject matter experts are going to speak to now the regulations for in vitro diagnostics as well as pharma and biologics. So if you have any questions about that, we'll cover that and some of those regulatory changes. Basically in the US prior to 1976, there were no regulations about bringing your new medical product uh, device to the market. And it was sort of a free for all. Um, in 1976, FDA realized shoot, we need some regulations. And so they implemented what's called the Medical Device Amendment to the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. And then you see there's a big gap between 1976 and 1990. And I think some of you will remember a very famous commercial called The Rise of the Machines in 1984. And what happened in that interval is the creation of microprocessors and software-driven equipment. Prior to that, most devices were mechanical or optomechanical. After, in 1990, FDA said, shoot, we better catch up. So in those days, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, regulation was about 10 years behind technology. Now they're about two to five years behind technology, but innovation is always ahead of regulation. So there was a series of safe medical device acts and amendments and authorizations in this continuum of regulation. So I've lived through most of that. In the meantime, in Europe and the rest of the world, there again, weren't many regulations, but after the EU common market was developed in the early 90s, the European regulators looked at what FDA had done, where FDA had said in 1976, nothing new is going to be invented. And then, oops, something new was invented. So what they did is they made a risk-based classification of how to bring your medical product to this European common market. And this shifted everything. With this CE mark, with this good housekeeping seal of approval, you could now sell to a market in all of Europe, anyone who was in the EU common market, which was essentially equivalent to the GNP of the US. And it was a quite easy process. 
The idea of CE marking was that you would give safety and performance data and your effectiveness would be proven out in the marketplace. And that worked very successfully. And most of us went Europe first because it was easier and there appeared to be a lower burden of proof to get into the marketplace and start getting some return on your investment. And of course, grease the skids with some data when you came back to FDA and you were going to go through the FDA process. That worked very successfully until about 2010. And I just call this the PIP and HIP safety issues. There was a breast implant issue and then an implantable HIP issue where the marketplace showed that these devices weren't as safe and weren't as effective. Europe took a big step back and said, we don't want this to happen to our general population. And they brought us to where we are now, which is the European Medical Device Regulations or EU MDR. Unlike other regulations in Europe or surrounding initial CE marking, EU MDR went into effect immediately. There was no transition state. It's been in effect since May, 2017. The regulators also decided that the notified bodies, the regulatory agencies that give you permission to conduct a clinical study and give you approval to access the market. So commercial entities took the place of one federal authority, FDA, and these notified bodies had expertise in different areas. Before EU MDR went into place, there were 277 different notified bodies. Last week, under the recertification, there are now 21 notified bodies. So right away, you can see a constraint of the change of these medical device regulations. At the same time, the amount of evidence you needed, usually gathered in a clinical trial, increased significantly, as well as the legal and regulatory requirements, which again um, is increasing your time to market and return on investment. When I talk about clinical trials, I'm talking about clinical trials in humans and what, how are we going to go to market? So very strategically, we used to pick Europe first because the perception was that it took less time and less money to go get a CE mark, which was also accepted pretty much globally um, as CE mark proved its worth into the 2000s. On the other hand, FDA's pathway was a bit more rigorous from a pre-market perspective. Now that pendulum has pretty much reversed from the EU MDR, FDA has put into place a number of initiatives, including the 2018 breakthrough device designation, which doesn't give you priority to market, but it gives you priority review with, with FDA, whereas MDR has increased all the regulations. Now, what about everyone else who used to accept CE mark? Now it's harder to get CE marks. So what do you do in these other countries? Well, Australia and New Zealand got together and they were very clever. And in advance of this, they said, we are going to start accepting FDA approvals. So you don't have to get CE mark first. The UK, of course, did about face and did Brexit. So now we can talk about what kind of marking you need to get your product sold in the UK and the UK and Scotland and the UK and Northern Ireland and on and on. Japan and China have made big strides in their regulatory pathways, but for the most part, they were also based on CE marking. So now what do we do? Now I want to move on to our subject matter experts who are going to tell us about this current climate is going outside the US still your first best fastest option? Um, what about devices versus diagnostics versus pharma and biologics? And what about outsourcing? There's a lot of specific expertise that's needed 
to go outside the US now, including different represent representatives, legal representatives, and compliance to, I would say more rigorous regulations. So now I'm going to go on to our subject matter experts and let them tell you what this current climate is. Alison, thank you so much for this introduction to the topic. And if you don't mind, I would like to quickly introduce Salvius Legal so that, wa that way everyone knows who we actually are, right? So Salvius Legal, uh, we are functional outsourcing service provider who are focused on contract management and legal support for the organizations who are involved in the clinical research. And as you can see on this picture, you have a little glimpse of our management team. Over here, our CEO, Myrta Trompert, who is uh, present with us today, who will share her expertise in the field of the clinical trial uh, contract management, or COO, Ola Modrzejewska, and the director or hu of human resources, Judith Van Roy. But our team is also consists of almost uh, 20 teammates, who people who are involved in the contract management services are, have the legal background, but there are also uh, with the international, uh, international background. So each one of us is actually from another country, which helps us to support our clients with the legal, as well as cultural and legal, uh, lingual aspect of, of those negotiations, which allows us to do it around the globe. And when speaking around the globe, if you don't mind, uh, going to the next slide, we can see moving forward a little bit. You can see in a second <laughs> that uh, our headquarters are located in the Netherlands, but we also have a presence in uh, Germany, in South Africa, and oh, a little bit too fast. <laughs> and uh, we are also working very hard or extending our wings, let's say, in the APAC area, as well as uh, our presence in the States, and a little bit uh, down south from our audi uh, audience's location in uh, Central America, as well as South America. But uh, when speaking about self-use, we are uh, providing three main pillars uh, to our customers or our clients that we are collaborating with. And our day-to-day -day business that we have been doing for over 10 years now is side contract negotiations where we were working with our uh, sponsors on the preparation of the templates for them, review of those contracts that are about to negotiate when conducting the clinical trial, budget negotiations, and also uh, rescue management whenever the collaboration with the CRO is not going as smoothly as they would expect it to go. But besides the site uh, contract negotiations, we also support the organizations with the other contracts needed for the clinical research. And we are sure that they have a strategy uh, set up in the way, uh, the contractual strategy set up in the way that everything goes smoothly with them. And uh, one other topic that we are very closely involved with is uh, GDPR, you know, uh, it's a um, very hot topic in Europe. So over here, we make sure that the templates of our clients are compliant uh, with the GDPR and then to make sure that their whole process of the clinical study is also compliant uh, in that aspect. And uh, lately, we also have been working very closely with the startups to make sure that those organizations that are working on the development of their products are successful in the legal aspect. And over here, we have been collaborating also very closely with Loomis uh, to make sure that our, our clients are su successful in that aspect. And uh, Heike is able to tell you a little bit more about uh, Loomis now. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you also for the invitation to join uh, this discussion today. Um, yeah, I'm the managing director of the Loomis Group. My name is Heike Schön, and I will just shortly show you what the group is in Europe. Next slide, please. Okay, we are consist out of three companies. Uh, one is Loomis International, located uh, in Germany with a branch in Switzerland. 
And um, we do represent uh, clinical trials, uh, sponsors for conducting clinical trials. This is a prerequisite uh, by the European Directive. If you are not located in Europe, you don't have a subsidiary there, you need a legal representative. And we represent you in front of the authorities and we are civil and criminal liable. So we, we step into your feet, as to say. Uh, as a legal representative, we can also obtain or try to obtain a, a small medium enterprise status for you in Europe, which is given by the European Medicines Agency and provides you with a lot of um, financial benefits and also regulatory benefits if you have an SME status. The other one is the orphan drug designation. If you develop an orphan drug, you can apply for often drug designation with the EMA, which also gives a lot of benefit, but always you need a legal representative if you are not located in Europe. And we can also support you during the marketing authorization application until your product is registered. Um, as Kasia already mentioned, GDPR is a hot topic in Europe uh, since a couple of years now. And uh, so we also do data representation, which is also a requirement according to Article 27. If you are not located in Europe, you need a data representative. This is not the same as a data protection officer because this is a certified position which uh, consults the company. We are just representing. Then we have, uh, due to Brexit, we have also Loomis International Limited. Here the focus is really on GDPR because the GDPR UK requires the data representative to be registered in UK and we have an office in London. And the third company which we have founded last year is our, one of the young companies. This is Loomis Life Science Consulting and Loomis Life Science Consulting is a result of a lot of consulting requests we had uh, from Loomis, Inter Loomis International. And there we provide consulting and also, of course, solutions for the biopharmaceutical and medical device industry. And this covers to discuss your yeah, outsourcing strategy, how to select the best uh, suitable vendor and how to manage the vendor, which is, of course, a big issue uh, when you look at clinical trials uh, regulated by ICHGCP and the second revision. Of course, we also support uh, and yeah, do with clinical and quality oversight management. And uh, also together with Salvius, we are going into conflict resolution if there's any problem with uh, the vendors and uh, from the operational standpoint and Salvius from the legal standpoint. And we can also support uh, when you move from the yeah, preclinical to the clinical transition to perform the gap analysis. And yeah, it is our philosophy that everybody should work very close together, very transparent, and especially in, uh, in today's very global environment, it is very important that you are aware of the cultural differences. It's not only the company culture, but it's also the uh, people working from different cultures in different companies. And um, if you are aware of these and the different workflows uh, and yeah, communication, I think this is a very important basic to develop a good cooperation, which should then be based on trust and transparency. And, um, and of course, everybody should strive for the same goal to conduct a very good clinical study uh, with the highest quality, best budget, and of course, achieving also the optimal timelines. So next slide, please. Yeah, why are, why are we there? Um, because, yeah, at Dooms International, when we founded this company eight years ago, we wanted to facilitate non-European companies uh, to come with their innovative products uh, to enter the European market, and we wanted to make it easy for them. And with life science consulting, we have a passion to optimize, which you might have heard already, <laughs> to optimize the cooperation of the sponsor and vendor during the drug development process. And uh, it is our goal really to accelerate your business and to have the best positive impact on your partnership, which, which should reside in, of course, shorter time to market for innovative products, a realistic budget, but maintaining the highest quality and with a good vendor sponsor team striving for the same goal. And this is the overview of Loomis, uh, of the Loomis Group. On the next slide, 
we have our contact details if you have any questions please just contact myself uh, we are also offering a, a free consultation for the first call uh, up to 15 minutes basically and uh, so if you have any questions don't hesitate to to call us or to email us thank you i think now we, it's uh, time to uh, hand over again to Alison. So thank you very much. I wish I had known um, about Salvius and Loomis about two months ago. I had a client who was based in the UK running a subsidiary in the US. And I don't know why it was a surprise, but when Brexit occurred, they realized they needed to outsource and to find these experts to provide this representation. And uh, Heike alluded to the fact that there are different kinds of representation that are needed. So one of the things we wanna talk about is why do we need to outsource now because we don't have our own expertise? What is it that we need to outsource to comply with these European medical device regulations and the current environment for drug development? And and also, how do we comply with this um, in terms of different regional requirements? Um, GDPR, if you're not familiar with that, is a privacy law. And in Europe, there is a law called the right to forget you. So if you are posted anywhere on the internet or Google, you have the right as a private citizen to have all data removed about you. Um, this also impacts clinical trials because we consent you to participate in the trial. And if you consent and then change your mind, you've always been able to withdraw, but now you can withdraw your data as well. And that makes it very difficult to conduct a clinical trial because the data is our answer to getting to market. So Are there any specific questions in the chat that we'd like to that we'd like to address here? Allison, there's no questions coming through. Okay, so uh, let's talk about let's talk about uh, what do we need to consider as far as finding these vendors and. How do we choose the right ones? You just heard Heike say she, they work with Salvius and uh, they combine their skills together and together they will help you have a good relationship with not only the regulators, but with any contract research organizations that you're working with. So can, um, can, you, speak to, can you speak to these questions here? Who should start, Alison? Oh, go ahead, Heike. I'm sorry. I, mean, I told you, you should never have me drive. <laughs> OK, yeah, thank you for this question. I think, um, I mean, when it comes to outsourcing, it's a very complex topic. And, uh, and I always see this from two sides. One is, is your company ready to outsource? Because you have to think also what is needed when you are outsourcing. There might be certain workload increase which you do not have before when you didn't start uh, to outsource, for example, with your legal department, checking on contracts, or having the support of a legal uh, company like Salvius. Uh, financial, uh, your financial de finance department has suddenly to, to check on a lot of more invoices. So there are some processes which have to be reconsidered when you are going into the outsourcing and the acceptance of outsourcing within your company also. And then, of course, you have to find the right partner. And, uh, and this is where we, for example, uh, start and say, okay, what is your need? What is your budget? And then we can also work around to find the best possible uh, CROs to talk to. So at least, uh, let's say, a couple of CROs, but really reflecting on your need. And maybe it's only a geographic need that you only need a CRO in a certain country or you need a global CRO because you're quite advanced. So this has to be understood from the beginning. Your needs is important for us. 
so that we can uh, work around to find the best suitable vendor. And for example, if you have a medical device in development, you need to do a clinical trial. It would be very important that you find this here over actual medical device experience. And um, yeah, and I think the other part is really the, the finding of the right CRO going to a bit defense meeting to understand, to meet the people, to see who, what the team would be and if there, the social interaction uh, works well. But the other part of course is the legal uh, consideration. And this I would hand over to Myrtle to talk about uh, the contracting part. So yeah. Myrtle, I want to interject here that it used to be that only small companies would consider outsourcing or contracting these kinds of requirements. Now, even larger firms who might not have expertise in these countries are looking to subject matter experts like yourselves to help them decide, one, what's their target market, and two, what do we need to do to get in that market legally and get market access to sell there. So if you want to jump off there and talk about that a little bit. Yes, um, yeah, I hope I understand your question correctly, but um, uh, it is more and more the case that uh, also large firms are interested in functional outsourcing um, and um, um, outsourcing uh, specific uh, parts of the, the study pro uh, the, the study um, conduct um, and uh, with respect to uh, all the additional requirements and all the different laws and regulations when you're performing clinical trial, uh, it really saves uh, time and it really smoothens the process if you hire an expert in this area. Um, and uh, this is what we see more and more indeed, yes. So that this particular part, and we closely then, this is something that we do, for instance, um, in respect to uh, vendor contracting and site contracting and GDPR compliance. And um, um, we closely collaborate then with the uh, internal teams uh, of the companies to make sure that the, the process runs smoothly and that all the expertise is brought from, uh, you know, from outside, but and, and only for the part that it is required to bring the, the expertise to. Yes, yeah, so this is what we see more and more. But I also would like to um, add something to what Heike was saying uh, in respect to the collaboration with the CRO and how important it is to, um, uh, to have a solid contract in place and also to start contract negotiations fairly, very early uh, in the process. Um, because we have seen that um, it, it, it just increases the negotiation position for a sponsor. Um, if you start your contract negotiations in timely fashion, so that um, if you cannot get to an agreement with a CRO, that there are still alternatives and the CRO is also aware of this uh, and that you don't get into this situation where uh, you need to move fast. You know, time is always of the essence in, in clinical trials and you don't want to um, uh, be put in a position where you are do not have the possibility anymore to change CROs. I don't know, Heike, maybe you can also say something about it, that it is, you know, uh, interesting to also have alternatives already in mind for in case you cannot uh, get to come to an agreement with, uh, with a certain CRO. Um, um, so it is important to start the negotiations in time and also to invest some time and effort in the content of this contract. Because we have seen a lot of companies that feel that um, the contracting is an administrative hassle. And I am aware of that because not everybody is very fond of the whole contracting bit. And we like it, but we are very rare people, I would say. So um, uh, people often underestimate that um, the effect it can have if you do not properly negotiate a contract, really reflecting your right and um, that your contract is ensuring that you can comply with the, your legal requirements because as a sponsor, um, by virtue of law, you have all this, these final responsibilities and these requirements that you need to adhere to. And you need to make sure that you can do this also by instructing your vendor in your contract and that you have sufficient tools also and uh, yeah, sufficient tools for, for oversight and control of your clinical trial in your contract. And this is also something that Heike and I collaborate in um, 
Um, so I collaborate with Heike to ensure that there are sufficient KPIs in there, that the timelines are in there, there is a governance structure, so that if something goes wrong along the process, that you ha have very quick tools to um, get your study back on track. And what we have seen a lot is companies that have underestimated the, the importance of the contract or are a bit overwhelmed maybe when collaborating with, with a very large CRO and they are very pushy on their, their using their template, etc. Uh, and they agree to it. And then later on down the road, something goes wrong. The CRO is not performing and there are not there are no tools in the contract to um, get the study back on track. And this is also where Heike and I collaborate uh, uh, to, to help these companies resolve these issues. But this is always, of course, not the best situation. You can better prevent it than resolve it afterwards because you will lose a lot of time and it will also be more costly as you can imagine. So this is what I wanted to say about uh, contracting with your CRO in the beginning of the process. So for, for the attendees at our meeting who maybe haven't ever started a clinical trial or it's their first time going outside the US, I initially introduced that it was very simple to do this in the past. And I think you've heard now from um, Kasha, Merta, and Heike that it's not so simple anymore and that you have to start a little bit earlier in considering what kind of partnerships you need. Every single situation that you described, Merta, I have experienced where you pick a contract vendor and things don't go quite to plan because maybe the sponsor timeline gets delayed or you get in a situation where something evolves or you change a, another partnership. So could you talk about in today's environment, maybe Kasha, you and Heike can address this is what are the steps? What are the steps in order that you would suggest to a sponsor company to first select whether they want to go to Europe or the rest of the world, meaning outside the US, um, as a target market? And then what kind of steps would you take to ensure that your company is well positioned as a sponsor to conduct the clinical trial um, outside the US? Okay, I think if you want to, to uh, move outside US and let's take the example of Europe because I don't want to talk about Latin America or Asia at that stage. Um, if you want to come to Europe, I think it would be advice, uh, first of all, to yeah, for your strategy, why do you want to go to Europe? Is that part of your clinical development? Do you have, is there a market for your product? What is the, the prevalence you can look at? And, um, and then to decide whether it's worth to invest in moving into Europe, uh, because of course you have to talk you have to uh, deal with different regulatory authorities. We have the European system and from January onwards, it should also be harmonized, but still it's Europe. So we have national requirements to be fulfilled. And, um, and this is something to, to consider first. And then you should find, uh, as you have no resources in Europe, you need to find the CRO which uh, suits uh, your a position and helps you also to move in uh, finding the right sites. I think it's very important that you have that you work close with key opinion leaders. Uh, you need to, to have key opinion leaders in your clinical study because they are your marketing tool. If they accept your product, they would easily get the community also to accept your product. So this is something the sponsor has to do to yeah, please and work closely together with the key opinion leaders, whereas the CRO can cover all the processes for clinical trial application, for managing your regulatory uh, requirements and setting up the clinical trial. And of course, you need the legal representative. I should uh, not forget to mention it. <laughs> and, um, and, and we can also help uh, to, to set up your entrance into Europe by selecting the vendor or helping you to, to um, get contact to the um, authorities. So this is, I think, one of the first steps you should really consider before moving into Europe. Okay, and we've, again, we've referenced these different legal representatives that are required now. 
uh, Kasha or Merta, do you want to talk about um, the different kinds of representatives that a company that doesn't have an office in Europe must have now in order to comply? Because there's four or five, six different representatives that you have to have, and these require contracts and liability coverage as well. Well, I, I am aware of the most important ones that uh, legal representative that you need uh, when you're performing a clinical trial in Europe and you're not located there. And this is maybe, I can maybe this is more a topic that is, uh, that is uh, <laughs> um, uh, something that you can talk about because these are, these are the actual services that Loomis is uh, uh, providing to clients. Um, like, um, so you need to have the legal representative in Europe um, uh, when you're performing the clinical trial and you need to have a data protection representative in Europe when you are uh, performing a clinical trial in Europe and processing personal data, which is usually the case. So maybe Heike, you can elaborate a little bit on that. Yes, uh, before you can... So when you come to Europe, you, go, you do a clinical trial, you have to apply for a clinical trial number. So, uh, and uh, when you start to... Yeah, to apply for your clinical trial application when you want to, to get the clinical trial through, you need to have a, a legal representative in place by that time. So this is something also at an early start for contracting. And the legal representative then can also provide you with a letter of authority that uh, you will need uh, to sign in, uh, so that the authorities know that you have appointed a legal representative and also the legal representative has to appoint uh, the CRO officially for pharmacovigilance for entering into the database. So it's a central position which takes over some work from you in Europe and uh, but has also a certain responsibility to oversee what is happening within your clinical trial. And the other one is, uh, as Myrte mentioned, the data representative. Um, the data representative has to is a is primary a contact person for the supervisory authorities when you process data and you have to define through different contracts uh, the way the data is obtained and processed, secured, and how it is also securely used in the USA. Because outside of the GDPR region, the European region, you have to show that the data is still safe and, and complies with the requirements of the general data protection regulation. So this is the data representative. He helps you to collect or we help you to collect uh, this information with the CROs, write them down. You have to go into contracts, agreements uh, for data processing and the best is also if you have a data protection officer, this can be a consultant who also helps you to make sure what you need to do to comply with the requirements of the GDPR. So this is the most confusing part and uh, with the data representative, but uh, it's only at the beginning, once you have settled uh, the things, uh, it's quite smooth. Yes. So I recently got a question. I have been trying all during COVID to start a clinical trial in Europe in several different countries, including Germany and the UK, um, which of course is not in Europe now. And the question the ethics committee has is how are you protecting your data um, when it comes to the US? Well, our response was the data is not residing anywhere. The data is in the cloud, so it's not coming to the US. It's being accessed by people globally. So for instance, we have an imaging lab that's in Germany. So data from Germany isn't leaving, leaving Germany, but we're going to have clinical data from patients being treated in the UK. Again, this is all getting uploaded to the cloud. So when you start interacting with individual sites, regardless of what country they're in within the European community. Uh, how, do you, how do you respond to these types of questions? For those of us who aren't familiar with the data protection officer and the GDPR representative versus the legal representative. Do you mean uh, how, um... Uh, we respond to these questions. Yes. Um, uh, 
from from the sites or for the for from the individual sites or from the um, uh, the companies performing the clinical trial well the sites are the sites are asking us the ethics committee yeah. that are giving you approval at the site are asking questions about data protection be underneath the umbrella of the gdpr so yeah. how it, 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 i i can answer your question Alison, but it becomes uh, uh, really uh, maybe a bit too technical for the discussion because there was a, um, um, a court decision from the European Commission recently uh, that had to deal with data um, transferred uh, um, to the US and that where before there was a solution that was protecting um, that was protecting the, the data sufficiently in accordance with uh, GDPR and, and the court. And now it has been um uh established that it is not sufficient so they're now figuring out additional requirements to ensure that data that is going to the us is protected sufficiently and it has to do with your surveillance laws in the us so uh it will overrule um our our um the, our legal requirements and and all the 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 measures that we uh, take to protect the data. So it is a bit technical, uh, but uh, uh, parties in Europe are now a bit concerned when sending uh, data to the US, and maybe it's even to a, a European company using a server in the US um, uh, or, a, a, or a cloud solution from the US, um, where this can uh, become an issue. And this is something that is still also clarified on how to resolve it. There is no clear guidance yet there well of course there is a clear decision from the court but now um, different stakeholders in the industry and um, um, experts um, in, in data privacy are trying to find solutions for that but this is where the uh, questions are coming from um, we usually co collaborate with our sponsors to and, and advise them on the approach uh, in respect to this issue so that they can clearly communicate to their um, uh, to their sites and their vendors what happens with their data and how they are um, adhering uh, to the best of their abilities with the requirements uh, that GDPR and the European Commission are requiring. Thank you, Myrta. I think that your comment about things are not clear right now as some of these uh, regulations are enacted and tested out in the marketplace. So we had yeah. one we had one question, and I don't think this has a simple answer either. Which is, what is the least expensive place in the European Union to run a clinical trial? Who wants to take <laughs> that one? <laughs> well, this is uh, this is. Uh... It depends. <laughs> I can answer like a statistician. Um, so no, you cannot really say what is the least expensive because uh, Europe is uh, moving together and uh, you have different fees you have to pay. And sometimes certain investigator fees, fees are lower, but if it's an international study, normally it's equal equalized. So you don't pay less because it's uh, Bulgaria compared to uh, Spain. So I think you cannot really say what is the least expensive. You can look at the processes from the regulatory standpoint and say what could be the fastest country to start with. Mm -hmm. uh, which, for example, when you go to Belgium, it's a, it's a country, they are very clear on their requirements and they are also very fast on their decision-making processes when it comes to clinical trial applications. And I think this would be part I would think this is even more important because to have this positive outcome that the clinical trial was positively processed and approved within, a, within 30 days, for example, uh, this is important for, uh, for example, shareholders that they see things are moving on. So uh, the question is really what you want to, to share either with your shareholders, with your management, then you should maybe co uh, consider this, reconsider this question and uh, go where yeah, you can have a fast movement of your clinical trial. I mentioned when I did the historical perspective that many small companies, particularly medical devices, would have a strategy of Europe first, because with a small amount of pre-market data, 
we could get in the marketplace and actually start selling our product and see how it was working. And everybody knows the data from the clinical trial is what is the added value. Not that you're just there, but that you have data supporting the performance of your product. It's obviously, I said that regulation lags behind innovation. So if you have an innovative idea, um, should you not consider going to Europe now or? Absolutely not. You should consider coming to Europe. Okay. <laughs> I mean, all the regulations, the EMA is, is, uh, is focused on supporting innovation coming to Europe. And that's mm -hmm. why there are a lot of support for having SME status uh, to reduce massively the costs you need to pay for certain fees like briefing, uh, scientific uh, briefing meetings with the EMA. So it's, uh, it's very much supported by the organizations to, to get innovative products into Europe. Okay. And I would like to add there, if you are a company developing a medical device uh, that is also collecting personal data or involving personal data, that it is also recommended at the very early stage of the development, even of your product, to already get the right advice about GDPR uh, requirements um, so that you can really make it part of the DNA of your product. So once you want to go to Europe, that it will run much smoother to get uh, the, the approvals for and, and, and all the requirements uh, complied with when you are performing your clinical trial and bring your product to the market. Thank you, Myrta. That's an important consideration, especially with software driven or monitoring yes. devices now. You have to build those privacy considerations into the design. Um, you can't yes. do it after the fact if you want to sell under these European regulations. Are there any other questions that are coming in from the chat room? I don't see any questions, Allison, coming from the chat. Okay. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about, uh, Heike has given a good pitch for coming to the EU, and we've talked about what that process is, and that your timeline is extended. So any project has three legs, time, cost, and scope. Mm -hmm. And usually we want to pick like our attendee who asked, where's the cheapest place to go? Time and money usually translate into a longer timeline. So usually we consider and contact the KOLs, the key opinion leaders in that region and then we also look at the regulatory timelines. Some of the regulatory timelines, unlike Belgium, are not so clear now. Um, is there a resource or do you, do, does Loomis and, and uh, Salvius offer insight into these pathways? How, how can your firms uh, support those who want to enter the EU in terms of maybe helping us figure out what's the best target market in terms of this runway to approach first. I mean, for, yeah, sorry, Mutu, you want to start? Well, no, well, I can only um, uh, comment on this in respect uh, or in relation to contracting and of course, uh, performing an international clinical trial uh, in Europe, site contracting part is also an uh, important aspect. Uh, and often perceived as a, as a delaying factor or a potential delaying factor. So here, I also would like to say that preparation is key, that if you know from the very beginning, uh, what are the requirements in each of, each of the countries, because we have to deal, you know, Europe is half the size of North America, but uh, the diversity of the countries that are in Europe is just massive. And there are all these different laws and regulations and different cultures, different languages. And, and, and requirements uh, that you need to be aware of if you want to um, have a very efficient approach. And also if you want to um, um, uh, have proper planning, because in some countries, for instance, you know, it will not take too long to negotiate a clinical trial. In other countries, it will take a longer time. Some, in some countries, you need the, the signed contract before submitting to the ethics committee. Um, 
um, yeah, of course, you have to deal with the different languages and timelines that uh, come with translations of documents. Um, you have to do. You have to also take into consideration, for instance, that in South the southern southern part of Europe uh, in August you cannot do anything because everybody has a summer holiday. Um, yeah, but this, these are these very simple things that if you do not know them and you make your planning, you can create a lot of um, hassle for the progress of your trial. Um, and although if you know it up front, you can really uh, prepare for it and plan accordingly and also know, for instance, which type of contracts are required in each of the countries so that you do not lose any time in the beginning where, where the site comes back, no, we want this contract or we want additional, in addition, we want these contracts to be in place. So to be aware of what is required and to make sure that you have a very efficient and, and a realistic planning will really help you uh, with the, the start of your clinical trial. So this is with respect to the, the contract, but I think that Heike can add uh, in other aspects to this. Yes, for example, if you um, want to look for which countries would be the most or the best suitable countries to uh, start your clinical trial or go with your clinical trial, you can look at this from the operational standpoint, saying how many patients would be available, how easy are they, what are you know the, the treatment options these patients have at the moment? So then, uh, what is very recommended is if you start with a smaller CRO or with a CRO on a feasibility assessment on the feasibility assessment of the countries. I am lost here now. I see blank. We can hear you, Heike. Ah, okay. <laughs> because sadly, all the pictures were gone. <laughs> okay, so you have the. Uh, <laughs> You have the, um, if you conduct a feasibility assessment so that you can understand where your patients would be uh, located uh, so that you can, oh no, you are back, um, so that you are, uh, make the right choice. And then also from beginning of next year, it's now anticipated that the new clinical trial regulation will be implemented in January next year, because then also this clinical trial um, um, statistics, uh, the um, Oh, sorry, I forgot CITES. Um, the information, the clinical trial information system will be ready. Uh, then the regulatory work will also be uh, more smooth. And it will be only one country which will take care of all the clinical trial applications independent on the amount of countries you will work with. So there will be also uh, yeah, less time needed to get a clinical trial applications through. But I think I would do both. I mean, the feasibility is always very important and um, so that you understand where your patients are in Europe. Well, thank you very much because I've lived through CE marking when it was super easy and super smooth. We all wanted to go there first. Um, I think EUMDR, because it's a change, has slowed things down. I... I'm hearing you all say that you should start planning early. I know plan is a four letter word, but we are hearing that we should plan early, that we should pick our targets very strategically, that we need to do due diligence about what is the regulatory pathway, um, not just the regulations, but the contract considerations, the representation that we need in those countries, um, before we even start our application or during product development, we have to consider privacy laws and data transmission requirements. And then before we have our application go to the ethics committee, we have to also consider what the ethics committee timeline is. The ethics committee used to be the hard driver of your time to market, but just like in the US, contracting is now becoming sometimes a longer timeline if you don't understand the legal and language requirements of contracting. And then I'm so glad that both all of you are saying, please do come to Europe. We welcome innovation and we are here to help you navigate uh, these changes because we're in a big revolution, not even evolution in the European community right now.